This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream and our streaming service Nebula. I've made another full-length companion video to this one that explores how a baby's brain looks a lot like an adult's brain on drugs, which you can access when you sign up for the CuriosityStream Nebula bundle for less than $15 a year at curiositystream.com slash neurotransmissions. I'm pregnant. Very, very pregnant and very, very ready to not be pregnant anymore. I'm nine months in and we're expecting baby Brainiac to arrive pretty much any day now. It's gonna be a very big change for me and Micah and the process has given me a lot to reflect on. Now, obviously, I've been considering all the ways that this is going to affect our lives, but I've also become fascinated by all the milestones our baby is hitting as they're still cooking in there. In particular, it's been fun and kind of weird to think about their brain. Newborn human babies are extremely squishy, so it's sort of easy to forget that when they're born, babies already have incredibly complex, highly developed brains. Human baby brains go from a single pair of cells to a fully formed functioning brain in just nine months. This processing powerhouse is the thing that makes humans unique. And I wanted to share how it all happens, because honestly, the more I learn about this process, the more magical it all seems. If you're watching this video and you've ever taken a sex ed class, and uh, I hope you've had at least a couple. It's called a condom. 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 You probably know the basics of human conception. Roughly once a month, an ovary releases an egg, which is picked up by the fallopian tube and shepherded gently down toward the uterus. If there is sperm present in the fallopian tube at the time when the egg passes through it, the egg can be fertilized by a sperm. Once fertilized, the egg starts to divide into more cells and if all goes well, it will travel to the uterus and embed itself into the soft, nourishing endometrial tissue, where it will continue to grow. <sighs> Running out of breath? Yeah. Now, despite the messaging of certain kinds of American sex ed classes, this process isn't a guarantee. There are only a few days in any given month where sperm and an egg might both be present in the body at the same time. And even then, there's only about a one in three chance that a fertilized egg will successfully embed itself into the uterus. And it's not always smooth sailing after that either. About one in three to one in four pregnancies will end in a miscarriage, often during the first few weeks after conception, usually because of chromosomal abnormalities. It turns out that there are a lot of things that have to go perfectly in order for a pregnancy to work out. The right egg, the right sperm, the right timing, the right condition of the fallopian tube and uterus, the list goes on. I myself experienced a miscarriage last year, and it was really tough. Not only because it required so many appointments and extra medical care, but also because of the grief that went along with it. Most people, especially people who don't have kids, don't realize how common pregnancy loss is. But I'm really grateful that I was able to get lots of excellent medical care during that experience, and I feel very lucky to be here now. With my current pregnancy, we found out in August of 2021. We had been hoping to grow our family for a while, so it was very exciting and a little nerve wracking to learn that we were expecting again. Interestingly, because of how we calculate pregnancy, you actually can't get a positive pregnancy test until you're almost four weeks pregnant, which is about nine to 11 days after the egg has been fertilized and shortly after it embeds itself in the uterus. Now, I know that this might seem like a strange way to calculate the beginning of pregnancy, but the clock technically starts ticking when you get your period, and the egg usually isn't released until about two weeks after that. Now, since I was testing pretty regularly around that time, when I finally got my positive test, I had already been pregnant for a month, even though it had only been a couple of weeks since ovulation. I, I do have a hard time because I feel like I'm going really fast, even though I don't think I actually am because I'm getting breathless. Yeah, yeah. At this point, we had cleared the initial hurdles and baby was just a cute little blastocyst all cozied up in the uterus with all those little cells dividing. And it's 
pretty amazing how quickly things really start to happen. Obviously, at that point, there's nothing resembling a brain yet. But right around now, brain development is just beginning. Now, from my perspective, I started feeling exhausted all the time and developed a serious aversion to meat. But inside, my baby's brain was starting to form. Now, as the cells of the blastocyst continue dividing, they begin to separate into distinct layers. And the outermost of those three layers, called the ectoderm, is what will eventually become the nervous system, as well as the skin and pigment cells. The embryo starts to get longer, though it really doesn't look much like a human yet, and it's only about a quarter of an inch long, which is smaller than a grain of rice. Think of like the size of a speck of glitter. But despite its super small size, the neural tube has already begun to develop. This tube will eventually become the brain and spinal cord. So this is a very delicate time during brain development. Interruptions here, like a high fever, can affect the formation of the neural tube and can lead to problems such as spina bifida, which is when the spinal cord doesn't form properly, which can lead to physical or even intellectual disabilities later on. Then, over the next two weeks, the neural tube divides into roughly four sections. The prosencephalon, which goes on to become the forebrain, the mesencephalon, which will become the midbrain, the rhombencephalon, which becomes the hindbrain, and finally, the spinal cord. Different parts of the neural tube also end up processing different kinds of information. The top, or dorsal part, ends up becoming where sensory information is passed up to the brain and the spinal cord, while the bottom, or ventral part, ends up providing motor information to the muscles. Now, <laughs> as a former cellular and molecular neuroscientist, I could talk for hours about all of the really fascinating and amazing protein expression patterns and migration and development of different kinds of cells and tissues that happen at this point. But since talking about all the steps of human brain development would mean I'd still be talking by the time this baby is born, I'll just give you this one small fact, which is that one of the key proteins in this whole process is called Sonic Hedgehog, because that's what happens when you let Gen X nerds name things. Gotta go fast. I really doubt anyone would want this, but if you do want an entire video dedicated to getting into the weeds on protein expression, you can let me know in the comments. By week six of pregnancy, which is just about a month after conception, the neural tube has fully closed, and some of the rudimentary organs have begun to form, including the ears and eyes. It's around this time that the embryo starts to sort of resemble a human, though it still looks pretty similar to the embryo of any other vertebrate species. It's much bigger than it was, but still really small. Like, think the size of a jelly belly. The walls of the neural tube contain neuroepithelial cells, also known as neural stem cells. And some of those cells become neuroblasts, which are a sort of primitive nerve cell. These cells end up forming the brain's neurons, which first form gray matter and then grow nerve fibers that become the white matter. I imagine it's sort of like a plant growing roots. Now, at the same time, that prosencephalon begins to further divide itself, bubbling out to form the telencephalon, which eventually develops into the cerebral hemispheres of the brain. The bottom becomes the diencephalon, which eventually becomes some of the middle parts of the brain, like the thalamus and the hypothalamus. And the mesencephalon and the rhombencephalon, on the other hand, end up becoming the brainstem. It's kind of wild to think about how much that early brain development ends up creating the unassuming brainstem. To me, it really just goes to show how important that structure is. In neuroscience, the cerebral hemispheres get a lot of attention because they're responsible for processing language and cognition and processing somatosensory information. But that brainstem is really important for things like, you know, breathing, sleeping, keeping your heart beating. So it's very important for development to get things right at this stage. As the brain begins to form into these different regions, the cells will continue to divide and grow. Even though these regions begin to form so early, they won't be fully developed until well after the baby is born, like even on into early adulthood in most cases. But I'm getting ahead of myself. <sighs> Doing good. 
By about eight weeks of pregnancy, so still early on during the first trimester, when the baby is only about the size of an iPhone app icon, there begins a huge migration of newly formed brain cells as the neural stem cells begin to divide and travel to their final destinations. In the cortex, this is actually a very cool process where newly formed brain cells climb along cells known as radial fibers or radial glia until they reach the proper cortical layer, which you can kind of think of like the brain zones of the brain. Once they're there, the cells can then finish differentiating into astrocytes and neurons. During this whole process, the brain is basically building itself from the inside out, forming the innermost layers first, and then building upon them to create the outer layers. To put that in perspective on the outside, the first appointment I had with my OB was at about week nine of pregnancy. That was the first time we got to see baby Brainiac, bouncing around like a cute little gummy bear. They were just starting to look like a person by then, and already their brain was growing like crazy. Yeah. But even though those brain cells start to migrate by about eight weeks, it takes a little bit longer for neurons to develop enough to start making connections with one another. Synapogenesis begins right after the end of the first trimester, around 13 to 14 weeks of gestation, when the baby's about the size of a pack of gum, and that synapogenesis continues for pretty much the rest of their lives. Another important component of brain development is actually cell death and synapse elimination. Apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, begins to occur around the same time that synapogenesis starts. And by the middle of the second trimester, the brain starts to refine all those connections by pruning some of them back. In fact, the number of neurons in the brain peaks before the baby is ever born. By the time a baby reaches full term, they have about 100 billion neurons. Now, we used to think that you were born with all the neurons you would ever have, and that there was no neurogenesis in the brain in adulthood. We've since learned that's not entirely true. Some new neurons can form in the brain after birth, but it is true that the vast majority of neurogenesis occurs prior to being born. Talking is hard, there's no room left. What's really incredible to me is that all of the stuff I've talked about so far starts to happen before it's even obvious that a person is pregnant. It's really amazing how much development happens when a fetus is so, so tiny. Even halfway through pregnancy, at around 20 weeks of gestation, I was barely showing. Though of course, when I looked in a mirror, I thought I had a pretty big baby bump. And it wasn't until around that point that I was able to start feeling my baby move, even though their brain was already growing so much. Of course, babies still have a lot of growing to do before they're ready to join the world. It's believed that babies aren't even capable of doing anything resembling thinking until about 24 to 28 weeks of pregnancy, which is about when the third trimester starts and the baby is about the size of a French press. That's a pretty long time to go before we get to consciousness. Now, I think this makes a lot of sense because the beginning of the third trimester is when another critical brain development process begins, myelination. Myelin acts like insulation around the axons of neurons, and it's really important for helping neurons send signals quickly and efficiently across the brain and throughout the body. The third trimester is also a really important time for growth, for a baby's brain and for their bodies. By the time the third trimester begins, a fetus is actually pretty highly developed, and the final three months of pregnancy are spent mostly packing on the pounds and getting all of those organs ready to function on their own. During the third trimester alone, the baby will triple or quadruple in weight and their brain will double in size. That means they go from the size of a French press all the way to the size of a gallon of milk. During all of the developmental stages of pregnancy, the baby starts practicing using all of their systems. They start moving their arms and legs pretty much as soon as their limbs develop, around 10 weeks. And they can hear sounds inside the womb and even see light and dark as their sensory systems begin to develop, around 16 to 18 weeks. As the baby gets bigger and the pregnant person can feel them moving, I can say from experience, there's a lot of kicking and wiggling around. If their behavior now is any indication, baby Brainiac is gonna be a dancer or a boxer or a soccer player or something. The baby's nervous system is also preparing for all kinds of important outside activities, like breathing, swallowing, and even urinating. 
They actually practice all of this while they're still in the womb so that they're ready for the cruel wide world when they leave their warm, comfortable home. <sighs> for a long time, infants were considered full term if they were born after 37 weeks of gestation. But these days, 37 weeks is actually considered early term because now we know that it's better for babies to keep cooking for just a little bit longer. So unless there are health concerns for either the parent or the baby, most healthcare providers prefer to wait to deliver until at least 39 weeks of gestation to give the baby plenty of time to get ready for the outside world. And brain development doesn't stop when the baby's born. The brain continues to grow in size after birth, reaching about 80% of its adult size by the time a person is just two years old, which is part of why toddlers look so adorable and silly with their enormous heads. Synaptogenesis continues throughout the lifetime, but there's a lot of activity happening during early childhood and adolescence. Research has indicated the brain doesn't finish fully maturing until we're in our early 20s. This postnatal development is really important because humans evolved some paradoxical traits that involve our big, brilliant brains. See, we're incredibly smart creatures with very large brains for our body size, but we're also bipedal, which requires a narrow pelvis to allow us to stand up on two feet. Generally, when it comes to birth, Big brains and narrow pelvises don't mix very well. This is why human infants are so utterly helpless and squishy when they're born. They have to be born at a comparatively early developmental stage in order to not kill the birthing person on their way out of the uterus. So even though those first weeks and months are incredibly exhausting because newborns require so much constant care, it's definitely better than the alternative. That time is also important for brain development, as all of the new sensory input helps the brain further refine its connections and signaling. But right now, sitting here at about 39 weeks pregnant, I'm mostly concerned with making the transition from having an inside baby to having an outside baby. Evolution walks a pretty fine line sometimes, so late pregnancy and birth are not exactly easy processes for humans. But we are so excited to meet baby Brainiac any day now, and to have the opportunity to watch their brain grow and develop in real time, right before our eyes. By the time this video posts, we'll be parents. I can't imagine a bigger or more interesting science project than this one. <sighs> okay. One thing that we're really excited to experience is watching our baby learn about the world. Because the brain is continuing to develop for years after birth, infants and children have incredibly unique ways of interacting with and understanding the world around us. And it can be hard for adults to understand how kids' brains work, but some people have said that being on mind-altering substances like LSD can actually reproduce some of the same kinds of experiences as being a little kid again. Unfortunately, a video like that would probably end up getting demonetized on YouTube, which is why we've opted to instead post a second video on that topic over on Nebula. Nebula is the streaming service we've been building with our creator friends to make a space where we don't have to worry about demonetization or the algorithm and can instead focus on creating unique, high quality content that can't be found anywhere else. All of the content on Nebula is ad free and it's home to many of YouTube's top creators, including people like Philosophy Tube, Legal Eagle, and Medlife Crisis. And now, Nebula is partnering with the amazing online documentary streaming platform CuriosityStream to offer a special deal where you can access both services for the price of one. Between CuriosityStream and Nebula, you'll never run out of new stuff to watch, including lots of neuroscience content. I personally really enjoyed the series Curious Minds, The Science of Sleep, which does a deep dive into what we know about sleep in the brain, why not getting enough sleep is a real problem, and what kinds of treatments exist for improving sleep quality. I love sleep, so I enjoyed learning more about it while I prepare to be sleep deprived for the next couple of years, I guess. <laughs> also, did you know that newborns can't stay awake for more than an hour after they're born? 
Their brains are still growing so much and they get so exhausted and overloaded that they just pass out all the time. Anyway, CuriosityStream really loves creators and they love supporting educational content like ours, which is why we've worked at a deal where if you sign up for CuriosityStream, you can get access to Nebula for free. Right now, CuriosityStream is offering a deal for 26% off their annual subscription, which works out to less than $15 per year for both services. That's a way better better deal than any other streaming service. And if you sign up today, you'll be helping to support Neurotransmissions and our baby Brainiac, as well as all kinds of other amazing educational content creators. So to see that entirely new video without any ads and to support our diaper fund, click that link in the description or just go to curiositystream.com slash neurotransmissions to sign up for just $14.79 for a whole year of educational goodness. It really helps us out. We're obviously going to be a bit busy for the next few months, but I honestly can't think of a better way to observe the brain at work than through the eyes of my baby. Let me know if you want a video about brain development after birth. And if you're here all the way at the end of the video, let's have some fun. Leave your bad parenting advice down in the comments below. Thanks for watching this episode of Neurotransmissions. Until our next transmission, I'm Ali Astrosyth. Over and out.